so the so the the if you take the Addy model and I put a, a planning and project kickoff before the A. So so it's really and and before that it starts in the intake process that leads to a project plan, which leads to getting aligned with the stakeholders and all that so that they can see we've got a reasonable plan and blah, blah, blah. And that's why we're going to do analysis and design and development and all that. Exactly. Now, implementation and evaluation, the tail end of the ADDI model, need to reflect exactly what was happening and discovered in the analysis phase. And most people don't see that. I, if I've done my analysis correctly, uh, uh, if I think like a, a, the late Joe Harless or the late Gary Rundler or Bob Mager and all those folks, if you're not focused on the outputs of performance, because everything else is a means to that end, and you know that output, so that's an, that output is an input. So what do people downstream need, which is the downstream customer? But then we might have regulators that are going to look at that output, and we can have you know, the, the financial bean counters in the enterprise looking at that output to say, what were the costs to produce that? And what are we selling it at? And we're going broke every time we sell one, you know, so there's a lot of stakeholders, but what are the stakeholder requirements for that output? Do we understand them? Because that's what, how you measure outcomes. Outcomes are either good or bad because we've either met or didn't meet the stakeholder requirements because the down, downstream customer can be happy, but the regulator the people from regulatory affairs say the regulators are going to invade us and shut us down because of what we're doing or because of how we're doing in the process box with our tasks. We're violating mm -hmm. safety standards when we produce that output. The output's okay. Our processes ain't no good. And so we need to understand the who the stakeholders are for our outputs and our process and understand what their requirements are, What understand what the constraints are, because that's how where measures come from. And, and so we can't measure impact if we don't understand that. Now, the, the right. standard quality measures are usually articulated as quality, quantity, and cost. In layman's terms, it's better, uh, better, faster, and cheaper. And so, you know, however your language talks about this, if you don't understand, go find yourself the quality people or the business process people and figure out what does your enterprise use as their measurement metrics. Use those. Don't introduce any new things that you learned at some learning conference because the world that you go back into doesn't care what the learning conference folks told you about measurement. Go figure out how we're measuring our business processes if we're in manufacturing or merchandising or in healthcare. How is the business measuring itself? And that's one of the reasons why you form this project steering team with the stakeholders, because they can tell you, because they know, because their numbers, their bonuses, their careers are based on, built on them hitting those numbers or exceeding them. And they worry when they aren't meeting them for whatever reasons, because the sun didn't come up today and now their numbers are bad and it's in their control, but they know what those numbers are. And so we can't always control everything, but we at least need to know how score is kept in our business. And, and so if you don't, because if you don't know how score is kept, you don't know how to play the game. You don't know how, how to make the maneuvers in order to get a better score and keep the other team from scoring or what, however that should be looked at. But, but so we need to understand that. And when we don't understand that, we can never really measure successfully impact. Now, in 1979, when I joined this field, I have a radio TV film degree and no official background. The people I went to work for had been working at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Detroit with Gary Rumler's brother. And, and so they were learning things from Rumler and Gilbert because they were the uh, place where things were experimented with because they could give Gary's brother this stuff and he would try it out at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Detroit and they would see, does that work or not? So they came at things uh, with this, this particular mindset. And when I learned about Kirkpatrick's four-level model, which isn't supposed to be levels, but, but that's how the world has taken it and reconstructed it, they told me, they taught me that we start with level four, impact, which by the way, was ROI back in 1979, because that's how our clients measure ROI. And that's what the impact, now you can have a couple of calculations to get to ROI, and that's all in that impact box, if you will. 
So we start with there. And if we're getting what we wanted, good. We don't need to do any other evaluations because evaluations are expensive. And why do we want to incur expenses when we don't have to? So we measure the impact. We go back out to the world of work and we see, have we improved from the baseline that analysis established? When we go out to evaluation, we're looking at the same dang thing, things. And we're looking to see, did we get better quality, better quantity, better lower costs, uh, uh, better, faster, and cheaper or not? What, what shifted in those numbers? And if you go, well, there's too many dynamics in that world of work for us to attribute success or failure to the training, well, then we, we rolled it out in pieces and we did a little experiments. We rolled it out here and seen whether or not th that improved compared to the rest of the operations that were going on, if, if, that, if your situation affords you that. Um, but so you can look at the very same things using whatever numbers are for quality, quantity, and co uh, costs, uh, by talking to the financial folks, by talking to the quality people, by talking to the business owners, or you can short a court, short cut all of that by talking to your project steering team, who are the managers who know what those numbers are, because that's what they live and die by. And so you can get aligned to that. So when you're doing your analysis, when you're doing your project planning, when you're doing your intake, you can figure out what are the numbers, what are the metrics that we would hope to affect? What does the client wish to affect and all of that? Because later on, several boxes later, that's what we should be looking when we look at evaluation. So, so that's the begin with level four slash five, if you will. When you look at three, well, did it transfer or not is the question, right? Well, what would be the earmarks of something transferring or not? It's those same numbers being impacted. So there's one thing that, that is key when you look at transfer. Guys learn something and he goes back out on the job. So a little short, a story here from my days at Motorola, and I happened to be able to uh, have this ability. Uh, this uh, I was able to work with uh, Neil Rackham, who wrote Spin Selling, you know, the best selling book in the history of selling books, uh, sales books. And uh, he was I was meeting with my manufacturing operations managers, the top of the manufacturing world at Motorola. They made stuff. These guys made it. The engineers designed it, but yeah, but we we made it real. And I'm talking to them about the fact that if that my thing has always been uh, everything that I produce is going to be 60 percent on practice with feedback. And they were going, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make, you know, that, that that takes up too much time. You can't put 20 pounds in a five pound bag if you're going to do all that practice with feedback stuff. So they were always at, at most thinking one and done. Try it. And that's so. I was struggling with this group. Neil Rackham was in the room with us and they already didn't like him because these are manufacturing folks. And Neil's standing there, uh, a mid-height kind of guy with this uh, goatee and this three-piece tweed suit with a British accent. And they, they weren't too sure that they liked him when he said hello and we all introduced each other. And he interrupted and he said, uh, do you, any of you guys play golf or tennis? They all did. He said, have you ever had a lesson? They all had. He had them. He just knew how to do this. This was masterful to watch this. He said, did, did they change your grip? Yes, every one of them had the, the coach or teacher, trainer change their grip. And he said, so what happened to ball control when you first went to use that new grip? Oh, it went here, it went there, it had no control. He goes, so then did you revert to the way you always gripped it? golf club or tennis racket and they all stopped because they knew that he had had them he had just walked them right into his trap and they all said yeah that's what. so he said the see the the coach which is what guy is talking about with this practice with feedback the feedback comes from a coach who is not looking at the initial results he's looking at the behavior the correct grip and guy, you 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 change your grip here. Keep the grip. Well, but the ball's going the wrong way. Well, keep the grip. Keep the grip. Swing, 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 swing. Pretty soon, the results become reinforcing of the new behavior, and that's what the job of the coach is. And so, guy wanting to do more than one practice exercise is really all about that. We want to give people the initial competence because they've got ball control with the new grip. And we need to reinforce that. Um, and so 
this whole notion that that when we look for implementation, we might see that guy goes out to the world of work, tries what he's doing, and struggles a little bit. And that's when the supervisor will step in and say, guy, maybe you better do it the old way, the way you used to do it, because this is worse than you went off the training, you came back worse than you, you know, and so that's something that's a barrier to successful implementation. I mean, it can get out there and get started, but then uh, be stopped cold by a supervisor or the peers that I'm working with on the work team or the customer who doesn't understand what Sky doing, that's different, do it the old way. So there's many people out there in the performance context that could be part of the uh, uh, stoppage of the new thing, the new process, the new behaviors using new knowledge, new ways of doing things or slightly different things that are perhaps nuanced, but the initial results could not be acceptable. So maybe we have to go back to rework. So, so there's that. And the only way you can counter that is if you have the equivalent of the project steering team or the managers all aligned to this is the right grip and the ball control will be faulty to begin with, but it will soon work out and we'll have better ball control and distance and accuracy um, if we stay the course with the new thing. And people have to believe that. And they also have to expect that we're going to see some issues with, you know, trying it out. Because maybe the training, the learning didn't cover everything. And guys learn some things, but he has to go out there and now retrofit it into his performance context, which is different than everybody else's. And so they couldn't cover all of that and the nuances of what guy's going back to. Because, uh, Mike, we, we don't have time to cover your stuff because we're going to you know, cover what guy's world is like and, and make sure he's prepared for that world as best we can. And so you can't. So there's some learning that happens back out on the job through trial and error, through social learning. You know, we're, we're not in control of that, so we don't know how well that happens, how quickly that happens, how timely that happens. But we've got to expect that because that's the real world. And if this is, you know, the equivalent of guy blowing up the city of Detroit because he's well, then we, we, we bring all forces to bear to make sure that everything is that there is no slippage. There is no backsliding that that everything is in place for guy to do that. And we've taught him like we would teach an airline pilot for a commercial jet that's going to haul 400 people back and forth. We make sure that they know everything that we're doing. We've simulated their real world of work hundreds of times before we let them take the wheel. But most work isn't like that. It doesn't have that kind of risks or rewards. And so we don't attend to that. So that's another thing too, is that when we look at our project, we need to look at the the stakes. What's at stake? Is it high risks, high rewards, which are just opposite sides of the same coin? Or is this medium stakes? Or is this low stakes? Or is this hardly any stakes at all? And therefore, we shouldn't treat every project, every learning opportunity, every learning challenge as if they're the same. We need to look at it within its context with what, what's at stake, who the stakeholders are, what their requirements are, because maybe if guy screws up, the regulators shut the whole business down. Well, that's significant. <laughs> and we really need to do that one a little bit differently than we did one where, ah, he's going to have to rework that. It's going to take an extra 15 minutes. Um, and so the analysts at the front end need to be prepared to go in and dig that all out and, and come to the right conclusions. And the people that pr planned the project and gave Guy either half a day, two days, five days to go do that analysis, they needed to know, how do I size this for the project plan so that I can estimate my, my schedule and my costs and all of that. And so that project plan depends on the intake process and whether you clarified the request well enough and figure out all of the issues and nuances of the requirements and the constraints in this project that you might undertake. Now, there's a lot of talk also in our business about, you know, don't be an order taker. Well, Joe Hartless, the late Joe Hartless spoke about this in the mid 80s. A lot of cool stuff happened in the mid 80s because people were darn frustrated that the things that they learned in the 60s 
20 years later, I, what, nobody learned it? Huh? And so, so this is the repeating cycle that we're in. Um, but he said, you take the order and you do an analysis. And then you let the, what I would say, you let the analysis chips fall where they may. And if your analysis is done adequately and focused on performance, and you found out that it, it's not the knowledge and skills that are a deficit, it's the process is broken and faulty. And if people are taught to follow the process and they do, then woe is us because it's a no good process and that needs to be fixed and maybe you need to train other people on it. So when you get a request, the first thing is, is this for new hires? Oh, sure, duh. They, of course, new hires need instruction and training and all that. Is this a request to solve a performance problem? Because what the data shows us is 20% or less of performance problems are due to individuals' knowledge and skills. Deming said, the late quality guru, who was a statistician, said 94% of problems are due not to the individual, not to the teams doing the work, but to the system. And and the people like uh, the Rumlers and Gilberts and, and Magers and Harlesses and all those folks would say, it's about 20%. 20% of the requests that we get for doing training stuff ain't, you know, is going to be solved, addressable by training, but 80% of it is not. So if we go down the training path, produce training, implement it, we're not going to see impact. We can see that everybody got it, is using it, it transferred successfully, but the impact isn't there because it was the process. And people are doing the new, the old process just like we trained them when we should have revamped that process and they should be doing the new one. And if they did, then we'd have impact. So the, the, the front end and the back end of our methodologies, our processes, our practices are tied together. If, and the secret to all of it is a focus on performance, not on things out of context, such as a topic. We want you to talk about this, uh, this behavior. Oh, this, this you know, customer service behavior, you know, or however, whatever is articulated, or these competencies. And now we're into skills and skills mania, where we're going to what? address skills out of context well that's called education and we're going to give it to people and we're gonna we're gonna pat ourselves on the back and say yeah we we did it we nailed it we got those skills out there and we can see we can measure that people learned them in class are using them out on the job but it's not having any impact well eventually you know, learning and development leaders shy away from measuring levels three and four because the things, the data that comes out doesn't reflect well on them. And they don't know how to work with their clients and others to see what are the variables of performance, including knowledge and skills, but beyond knowledge and skills that we needed to attend to. We needed to figure out was the gap that's going on rooted in those other variables or is it is it knowledge and skills are a gap and some of the other things? People are working with bad data and they've got faulty tools. That's what's at the root of it. And people don't know how to say that's bad data or that's good data. And that's a good tool or a faulty tool. Maybe it's a combination of things. And since sometimes train, you know, this is what they used to say is that, you know, we have all these non-instructional interventions and then somehow training gets dragged into the middle of it at the end. Because we realized, oh, we've changed the process, we've changed the tools, we've got new data. People don't know how to work with that. We're going to have to train them. So training becomes a part of the solution set, and it looks like it's always involved. So maybe if we just do the training part, we'll have success, when actually it was a bunch of other variables that were addressed. It's, it's a challenge. Um, people don't do evaluation. They don't measure impact. They don't measure transfer because they don't know what performance tasks and outputs they should be looking at and how the real world of work measures them in their context, in their enterprise. And, and that takes a partnership to figure that out. You can't come in as a new instructional designer, new learning experience designer, and figure that out all on your own. And if you're begging and borrowing, trying to find people to work with you and help you on these projects, 
yourself, you may get the wrong person. I At Motorola, I had a project where I brought in my analysis report. On the front cover, I had the names of the six people that were involved in my analysis effort. These are the people that I work with. My head client saw those names and threw the binder across the room. There were 30 people in the room there with me. <laughs> I was kind of embarrassed because that made my, my product ain't no good. <laughs> he said, this is garbage because I had the wrong people. And I learned a very valuable lesson that day that from then on, I'm not picking anybody. You pick the, the people, the sources that I'll use, the people. You want me to observe something. You tell me where to go and where not to go. You tell me which documents I should look at and which to avoid. Or just tell me the people to look at and the places to observe and the documents to look at. And that will be my set of inputs into my process. And for clients who didn't like analysis, because one of them said, this, the same guy that threw the binder across the room, he had said, Guy, we hate it when people like you come back to us 90 days later and tell us what we told you on day one. He had had bad experiences with people in the training business doing analysis. They brought back a bunch of data and it didn't mean anything. It didn't do any good because they were focused on something other than performance. So I started with him and the people, 30 people in the room right then. And I said, okay, so these new supervisors you want me to train, what do they produce? What are some of their outputs? They're doing stuff. What are they producing and where does it go and who cares? And so we started looking at the outputs that people produced and we looked at the tasks and I asked them, so, so this one output that you're unsatisfied, you're not satisfied with, everybody's not doing it well. What's the cause of that? Because you guys are in manufacturing, you know, root cause analysis, you know, some of the quality tools and all that. So what's the, at the root of this? And they said, gee, we don't know. We're too far removed from that. Um, but that's a darn good question. And maybe you should go do analysis and go figure that out. And I said, all right, name the people that you want me to talk to across the 30 different locations of operations in North America for Motorola. And I'll go talk to those people. So tell me your best people who are doing this job already at a stellar level. And I'll go talk with them and figure out what they're doing. We'll try to get everybody to be like them. And then you can measure whether or not, because you, if you measure on the front end in analysis, here's the baseline for those operations, the products produced, the tasks performed, the quality, quantity, and cost metrics. And we've established a baseline for the current state. Post-instruction, post-training, we can measure the deltas in terms of what changed. And if it didn't change, we can swim downstream from the four levels, from four to three, and go, did it even transfer? No, it did, or it didn't. If it didn't, why not? If it did, and we're still not getting the right stuff, maybe what they learned was no good. Maybe we were focused on the wrong things. Let's swim down to level two. Did they even learn it? No, some of them didn't even learn it. That's why it didn't. So we can start at the end, begin with the end in mind, level four slash five, then go to three, then go to two, and then go to one. Because if guy is really happy with the training, but doesn't learn it, doesn't transfer, doesn't have an impact, who cares whether guy was engaged and found it to be a fun experience? Well, we're measuring activities and not results of the results of uh, transfer and, and impact. And too many organizations are just routinely doing that. One, because it's easy, it's cheap. And it gives us some level of self-assurance or something that says this must be good because they liked it and they learned it, which are the easiest things, but not necessarily the meaningful things in terms of getting to impact and ROI.